In the 1920s, traveling across the Atlantic was a limited option. One could take a ship, but that would take up to 12 days. Later on, Zeppelin airships offered a faster alternative, but were scarce and expensive. The need for a reliable passenger aircraft capable of round-trip flights between Europe and America arose. At that time, aero engines were not entirely dependable, often causing aircraft to make unexpected landings. This was feasible for flights over land, but not for long over-water journeys. Thus, the concept of using flying boats for transcontinental flights emerged, as they could safely land on large bodies of water. By the 1930s, the elegant American Boeing 314 Clippers were regularly crossing the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and British Short Empire flying boats were making trips from the UK to Africa, Asia, and even Australia. However, even before British and American flying boats were in operation, a massive and luxurious German flying boat briefly claimed the title of the world's largest aircraft. Claudius Dornier completed his engineering studies in 1910 and joined the Zeppelin airship factory. However, he was more interested in airplanes than airships. The Zeppelin company used lightweight alloys for their airship framework, which inspired Dornier to apply this technology to aircraft design. In 1912, he was given permission to establish a separate aircraft works in Lindau. Dornier's designs included the Zeppelin Lindau D I fighter, which featured a strong stressed skin structure. He also designed the all metal Zeppelin Lindau RS 4 seaplane. In 1923, Dornier took over the Zeppelin Lindau works and established his own company, Dornier Flugzeugwerk. He designed the Du J flying boat, known as the Wall, which was produced from 1925 to 1932. Dornier also worked on a larger flying boat design. The Duax, designed by Dornier, was not particularly innovative in terms of its features. It had a shoulder-wing monoplane design with a stressed skin over a duralumin structure on the fuselage and fabric covered with aluminum paint over a duralumin structure on the wings. The plane had wide sponsons attached to the lower hull for stability on the water and engines mounted in pairs in the cells above the wing. However, the standout characteristic of the Duax was its enormous size. It had a wingspan of over 155 feet and a length of over 130 feet, making it comparable in size to a modern Boeing 767-300 airliner. It was powered by 12500 horsepower Siemens Jupiter 9-cylinder radial engines, controlled by a complex system where the pilot relayed commands to the flight engineer. The interior of the Duax was designed with luxury in mind, featuring three separate decks. The upper deck housed the cockpit, navigation office, engine control compartment, and radio room. The main deck provided seating, writing rooms, bathrooms, a kitchen, bar, and a 60-foot-long dining area. The lower deck contained watertight compartments and fuel tanks. In October of the same year, the Duex set a new record by carrying 159 passengers and 10 crew on a 45-minute flight around Lake Constance. This number of passengers on a single flight was not surpassed for over 20 years. Following this achievement, significant efforts were made to enhance the interior of the Duex to compete with first-class accommodations on passenger liners. The passengers enjoyed upholstered leather armchairs, Persian carpets, and richly decorated furnishings. Although the Duex was designed to accommodate up to 100 passengers, it typically carried only 40 affluent passengers on most flights. The aircraft's engines were later upgraded due to being underpowered. The original air-cooled Jupiter engines were replaced with more powerful, water-cooled Curtis Conqueror 12-cylinder engines, each producing over 600 horsepower. This allowed the Duex to achieve speeds of around 100 knots and climb to an altitude of around 2,000 feet when fully loaded, which fell short of its intended cruising altitude of 10,000 feet but was deemed sufficient for a safe transatlantic journey. The Duex, an aircraft designed for transatlantic travel, faced a significant issue with its fuel consumption. Despite its powerful Curtis engines, the plane consumed around 400 gallons of fuel per hour at cruising speed. As a result, its first long-distance flight consisted of multiple short hops to allow for frequent refueling. After departing Friedrichshafen, the Duex traveled to various countries such as the Netherlands, England, France, and Spain before eventually landing in Lisbon, Portugal. 
The aircraft then underwent repairs for over six weeks before embarking on several short hops along the coast of West Africa. It later crossed the Atlantic to reach Brazil and eventually arrived in New York. The return journey from New York to Berlin was more successful, with the Duex completing the trip in just three days. However, as Dornier could not finance further flights, the aircraft was handed over to Deutsche Lufthansa, the German state airline. After some short trips along the German coast, the Duex attempted a flight to Istanbul in 1933 but was severely damaged during a landing accident near Passau in Bavaria. Due to a lack of interest from Lufthansa, the Duex was repaired and returned to Berlin, where it was displayed as the centerpiece of the new German air museum, the Deutsche Luftfahrtsammlung. The aircraft never flew again and remained on display until it was heavily damaged by Allied bombing in 1943. Most of the wreckage was removed by scrap merchants in 1945, and only a few fragments of the tail are currently exhibited at the Dornier Museum in Friedrichshafen. Only one Duex airplane was operated by Dornier and later by Lufthansa. However, two additional examples were sold to Italy. In 1931, the Italian airline Sanop purchased two Duex II planes. The main issue with these Italian planes was that they were equipped with 12 Fiat engines, each producing just over 440 horsepower. This further decreased their already limited performance when carrying a full load of passengers. As a result, both Duex planes were used by the Italian armed forces for long-range maritime patrols. They were even tested as bombers, with a bomb aimer station added to the lower rear hull. Unfortunately, the Duex II sustained damage in a series of accidents and was retired from service in 1935. Eventually, both Italian Duex planes were dismantled in 1937 and there is no remaining evidence of either aircraft. During the 1920s, there was a lot of excitement around developing a transatlantic airliner. The Duex was created during this time, but it faced significant issues. One major problem was its high fuel consumption, which limited its range to short distances. Additionally, the aircraft had a lack of engine power, preventing it from flying at high altitudes. This meant that it had to navigate through unpredictable weather over the Atlantic, which would have been distressing for passengers, despite the luxurious accommodations. However, the Duex's biggest setback was its timing. It was expensive to operate and relied on wealthy passengers who were willing to pay for luxury travel. Unfortunately, it made its debut during the Great Depression when the market for luxury travel was shrinking rapidly. As a result, no airlines, except for Sanaa, expressed interest in purchasing the Duex. Although the Duex was an impressive and easily recognizable interwar aircraft, it was not as commercially successful as the smaller Dornier while flying boats. These smaller aircraft continued to provide airmail and passenger services across the South Atlantic until 1938. This serves as a reminder that bigger does not always equate to better success.